Farming in the city is no longer an impossible task. And today, we talk to a company that specializes in hydroponics and are pushing to make sure that everyone has an equal chance at farming. This is Farming the Future. Urban Harvest really started off as quite like a, a hobby, a passion and love for plants and gardening and farming and a bit of a distraction from studying accounting yeah. and being bored by numbers and figures and realizing that there's a bit more to life, uh, which then led me more and more into this venture. And how it really began to take shape was when a, a friend who later turned business partner, uh, JD, <clears throat> who unfortunately couldn't be here today, uh, said, come on Dean, let's turn this into something else. Let's, let's make this a business, let's make it start to work. And this is how Urban Harvest was born. Why exactly did you decide to go with uh, hydroponics? I think the story really starts like uh, when I started with this whole gardening, permaculture, organic farming uh -huh. thing in Cape Town, yeah. uh, which is a totally, it's like a Mediterranean climate, lots of rainfall, good soil, things like this. And doing soil-based gardening was just so simple that it just worked. Uh -huh. And when I moved back to Namibia, it's, it's just a totally different climate it's arid it's like dry there's low rainfall low fertility in soils and things like this and so you have to find workarounds uh, for this uh, and combine that with the issue that we're so dependent on importing food from South Africa the market was just there and so this is when I started investigating into alternative growing techniques and first came across aquaponics which is basically combining aquaculture, which is the growing of fish, and hydroponics, which is growing plants and water. Yeah. And you put those two together, and basically you have a cycle whereby the fish uh, fertilize the plants, they take nutrients out of the system, and yes. then return clean water to the fish again. Yeah. Um, but it does come with a few difficulties. Mm -hmm. First of all, you've got two variables here. You've got your fish and you've got your plants. Yeah. And fish can be temperamental. They can get sick, they can get cold, and then they don't eat as much, meaning your nutrients vary quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And as we started looking into it from a more business perspective, when you need consistency, when you need to have a certain determinability yeah. with your produce, it just, didn't quite add up and so this is where we started looking more into hydroponics where you remove the fish element and you only have the plants growing in water and you substitute the fish fertilization by adding nutrients into your system and so you're actually dosing your system with the exact nutrients that your plants require um, and this can be very specific to plant species and things like this. Um, and so this is how the direction as Urban Harvest took into hydroponics. And there are many different types of systems. What we see here currently today is what we call an NFT system. Yeah. It stands for Nutrient Film Technique, which basically is a fancy way of saying water running in a pipe or a gutter. Like, <laughs> so there's a very thin film of water running along the base of the tube here yeah. and the plants just sort of dangle their roots just in it as we see here and they then absorb these nutrients up through the root system and into their into their leaves. Could I use foam or anything to plant the, 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 the plant in and still have the, the roots deep in water? Or like, mm. How do you determine what uh, to put in that container? Sure. I mean, I think that's a very valid question like, because first and foremost, because it's hydroponics, there is no soil whatsoever in the whole system. Okay. Um, and so also whatever you're using to plant into this is, is in no way a source of nutrition mm -hmm. for your plants. Okay. So what we, for example, you use here is a combination of cocoa peat and vermiculite. And <clears throat> essentially the function that that plays is just water retention, first of all. It has the ability to absorb water yeah. so that whilst the plant's roots are developing, <clears throat> they can actually begin to already absorb water into their system. Yeah. And then also just for root structure, just for the plant to actually have something to grow into. Yeah. But essentially you can really use any inert medium uh, of your choice. People use a lot of expanded clay pebbles, people use like plastic uh, foam containers yes. which are yeah. water absorbent. I think I've seen that before. Just explain to us how is this um, system um, better off compared to normal soil farming when it comes to nutrient distribution and all of that. How do the two uh, differ really? Mm. So I mean first and foremost the 
I mean, the setup in terms of dependability on environmental factors uh -huh. is, is greatly different. Okay. Um, when you're doing soil-based farming, you are dependent on your climate a lot of the time, on the weather, the temperature, your rainfall, the, the suitability of the soil in your area, uh -huh. these sort of things all determine your level of production capacities. And of yeah. course, modern day agriculture has found many sophisticated ways to work around this through the introduction of fertilization or the ability to transport water vast distances in order to get it to irrigation points and these sort of things but it is first and foremost you need a lot of space when it comes to soil based farming yeah. you actually need large vast tracts of open land and I mean a lot of the time this now results in things like deforestation because these are the most fertile areas lie and so many of these modern day farming techniques are also environmental techniques yeah. because as we can see around us here we're currently standing on a what used to be a parking lot um, and we're growing on concrete here so first of all we take away the soil factor uh, what we still do here though is like we're using a what we call a net house so it's just a shade net 40% yeah. which just helps mitigate the intensity of our sun here yeah. but it can go all the way to the extreme level of a climate controlled greenhouse where you control your light through giving LED light to your plants they don't actually get any natural sunlight you can control your CO2 levels your oxygen levels your temperature your humidity, oh. every variable basically that determines a plant's growth and success yeah. is being controlled in that environment, including the nutrients then. Because also what the system does is it recirculates your water. Yeah. So the water gets pumped into the system, the plants take up the nutrients that they need, mm -hmm. they transpire some water, mm -hmm. uh, which is then lost, but then the rest returns into the system. Mm -hmm. Whereas if in your soil-based technique, a lot of your water gets leached out yeah. so it either enters the root zone and then drains beyond the point where it's accessible to plants yeah. or it evaporates um, and so there's a lot of water loss but there's also a lot of uh, nutrient loss because a lot of the time your nutrients that you're adding into your system are also leaching out of the soil which becomes quite a big problem uh, especially when close to water sources that are also used for human consumption because yeah. that nutrients actually leach into groundwater into rivers and actually become toxic in many ways uh, especially with ammonia buildups and high nitri nitrates uh, in soil in water content yeah. which in the end is not good for humans uh, whereas this, you're really compacting your uh, impact uh -huh. in a certain way. It's not being felt elsewhere in many ways. Um, and then also by controlling a lot of those factors of production, you create the optimal environment for plants to grow in. So your yield becomes higher uh -huh. and the density of plants you can have in a certain space becomes higher. Yeah. So you can actually produce more food with less resources. One of the downside is, is that it is a rather capital intensive setup. Uh -huh. You do require a lot of materials in order to begin systems like this, yeah. um, which then for many farmers becomes inaccessible. Which then brings me to my, uh, to my next question, because mm -hmm. we're talking about how um, capital intensive um, it is, but like also how capital intensive you know, getting access to a piece of land is. What would you say are the basic necessities that one should have to have a basic working setup? Okay, I mean, it really it can, it can, there's a lot of variation in the complexity which you can start with for these systems. Mm. Uh, there's a simple system called, like, for example, the Kraski method, okay. which is essentially a container with water, okay. which some nutrients are put into, and plants just dangle with their roots in the water. Mm -hmm. And they just absorb, and you need and to no refill flow it. Of water or there's no it's flow. There's no flow. Just a container with water, and just the roots container, are just and they're just in there. There's oh, a really okay. lovely lady uh, here in Vintuk who does some of these systems, mm -hmm. and she really wants to take these to rural areas where, for example, you don't have access to electricity. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it can start off as basic as that, but then if you do have access to, for example, electricity or something like this, yeah, you it, it's you simply you need a place for your plants to grow in, uh -huh. whether it be a pipe or a container or, you know, a media bed or something like that. Uh -huh. And you need a tank for your water and you need a pump. These are the three basic it's components that you need for okay. this. Um, but you also, most importantly, require a certain level of understanding. Yeah. 
um, because essentially a lot of the time what we're doing with these modern day farming techniques is we're playing God. <laughs> we're taking the role of nature in growing. Yeah. So where you don't have to worry necessarily always about the level of iron or something like that in your soil because you know there is a complex soil life yeah. happening there that's adding nutrients to your plants. Yeah. We're saying no, we'll control that. Um, how do you measure that? How do you measure the amount of nutrient left in your in your container per se? Or how do you know how much uh, nutrients are running through here? I mean, so a lot of the time uh, there are, for example, pre-worked out formulas. Uh -huh. So according to the number of plants you have in your system and the size of your water tank or how much yeah. water you have, mm -hmm. add so much per week, for example. Uh, okay. Um, but for example, what we do is because it's a bit more of a precise operation, we actually use meters, electric meters. Okay. So we constantly monitor uh, our nutrient level through monitoring electrical conductivity, okay. which basically means that <clears throat> when there are dissolved solids in water, yeah. they have the ability to actually pass a certain level of currency between those solids. Yeah. And so the more dissolved solids there are in the water, the higher the level of electrical conductivity in that water. And some many very smart people have worked out, you know, what's the precise range you need for different types of plants. Yeah. So, for example, here we're growing pre almost predominantly lettuce. Okay. They require an EC range, which stands for electrical conductivity, of between 1,200 to 1,400. Yeah. And this is measured in micro siemens. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it can be very sophisticated and intimidating, but mm -hmm. at the same time, nothing is a better substitute for just understanding plants. Okay. Your plants will tell you what is happening. Yeah. So, like, if you if you learn how to read the symptoms of your plant, you know, you can immediately tell: is there a lack of nitrogen in your system, or is there a lack of iron, or mm -hmm. Are they having, uh, you know, problems with uh, calcium in the system or something yeah. like this? They're, they like you, you learn to read them like a book in a way. Like they have certain symptoms which Science, yeah. tell you basically what's what, wrong. What's lacking? Um, so this is where, like, in order to start, you do need to have a base level understanding, and this can be gained from the internet, from YouTube, or doing a course or something like this. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's nothing. It's not rocket science. Uh, it requires a bit of understanding around chemistry and biology. Um, okay. But it's actually exciting. Like you know, you're there's a, a saying basically that with modern days farming, you're substituting back labor for brain labor, basically. So it's a thinking man's game. Okay. Um, and yeah, I think this is sort of the the future trajectory of farming as a whole. The question is, what can we grow with this? Mm. You know, it's a very wide range of plants, but like, what can I put in this thing? Yeah, I mean, so I think taking it from, you know, the highest possible level, yeah. like, I mean, it's, people are doing scientific research on growing absolutely anything in hydroponics, from yeah. lettuce to potatoes to ginger to uh, tomatoes to really everything, yeah. like, yeah. I mean, certain things are limited in practical reality, like the amount of space you have and yeah. things like this. But in terms of bringing it down to somebody who is interested in doing it in their backyard, yeah. um, I mean, there are certain pl types of plants here who do better in our climate, yeah. um, especially more heat tolerant plants. Uh, but it also depends on the, the time of year you grow and then how much access to water your plants have and how direct in the sun they are. Um, so the simplest thing, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, for somebody to start with, it's almost always your green leafy vegetables. This is your your lettuce, your spinach, your parsley, basil, coriander. Yeah. These sort of spices and things like this. Okay. And the reason why it's the simplest is because they essentially go through one phase of life cycle. Mm. It's leaf growth. Yeah. Um, and so they only need a specific or a very uniform nutrient profile yeah. when it comes to that. Because yeah. uh, they grow leaves, you harvest them, you eat them, you're happy. Okay. And for that, like we usually do like an, an NFT system, such yeah. as this one here. Or you can also do what you call a deep water culture system, or DWC. Which is basically, it's a floating raft, usually a styrofoam or something like this with a hole in it. Yeah. And the plant just hangs 
suspended in the water basically uh -huh. um, and then can absorb nutrients through that. When you start looking into more fruiting crops, uh -huh. they do require a different system yeah. and also a bit more knowledge around life cycle. Um, so usually fruiting or vining crops are grown in what they call a beta bucket system, which essentially is a bucket uh, with a grow medium in it. So just on a larger size than this, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> in which the, the plant can sit and grow and then your water is also with nutrients applied through it, but also then recirculated. Uh, and basically what this allows is just a bit more space for the roots to develop yeah. because these vining crops first of all have a longer life cycle mm -hmm. and secondly they actually carry fruit on them so they yeah. need some sort of support yeah. um, but then in terms of their life cycle what makes it a bit more complicated is they go through three different phases of life cycle they go through leaf growth first of all mm -hmm. and then they do flowering and then they do fruiting Fruit. yeah. um, and each phase requires yeah, a different, different neutral and profile so you actually need to adjust your more nutrients that's what I'm <laughs> basically <laughs> more, brace. <laughs> more brace for you to be able to account for all these nutrients uh, that, that needs to be uh, to be filled in at uh, each different phase of growth but the thing is again plants are very adaptable they want to live they want to survive they want yeah. to run through their life cycle so yeah. On a very basic home level system, uh -huh. you don't need to worry about this too much. Like yeah. as long as you're adding a good nutrient profile to it. So mm -hmm. for example, here we add a combination of a hydroponic mix, yeah. which is essentially a mixture of all your uh, micronutrients, a lot of your phosphorus, potassium, calcium, iron, these sort of things. Mm -hmm. And then we also dose it with calcium carbonate, which yeah. is uh, a lot of where your nitrogen comes from. Uh, calcium nitrate, sorry, uh, not calcium carbonate. Uh, so it gets a lot of its nitrogen from there, which the nitrogen is basically what your plants need for your, for your leaf growth. Mm -hmm. And because you're adding these two in combination on a basic home system level, your plants will grow. <clears throat> they might not grow as fast mm -hmm. and as sophisticated as a commercial production system would need, but for a family that you want to, you know, just have some fresh produce, you want to yeah. see where it's coming from, you want to harvest it as fresh as possible, it works in this way. Right. Uh, I've seen people grow tomatoes and chilies and green peppers and all these things in NFT systems alongside your spinach and your basil and your lettuce and these sort of things. So you can sort of have a Greek salad growing <laughs> in your backyard uh, awesome. if you choose your plants correctly. Okay, which then uh, brings me to the next question because we've been talking a lot about um, specific amount of nutrients that needs to go into the water and all that. Um, this nutrients, is this anything that I could literally just walk up into like a, say uh, a local nursery and just pick up or you know say go to um, um, an agricultural shop and like pick up or is this something that's uh, th that I need to contact like a chemist for like a plug you know <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> um, I mean so firstly like this is it's quite a nascent field here in Namibia yeah. it's really at grassroots level still uh. um, so I mean it to answer your question yes it is possible to get some basic level of nutrients uh, going to your garden center or something like this like Ferreras uh. um, <clears throat> what we do here is that we buy it on a bit more of a, a bigger scale yeah. uh, on, in bulk and things like this okay. and we can actually go then and repackage uh, these nutrients into you know smaller scale system sizes so I mean we here for example we do actually develop like home systems yeah. uh, which is like a 40 grow hole system yeah. allowing you to have a good variety of plants that's like nice for like a family of two or four or something like this and then we sell kits with that to come with your your, your dosing nutrients and mm. we've worked out the specifications of how much needs to be added per week yeah. uh, as well as then we're able to supply people with seeds and things like this afterwards as well oh, or nice. seedlings more like it nice. so that as you're harvesting out of your system you can just replant again because um, this is sort of something that you need to factor in is that uh, you harvest plants but you need to replenish these again mm. uh, and some people want to do this they actually want to go through the whole life cycle of planting their seeds watching them grow yeah. harvesting and eventually planting back in again uh, but other people just want it for the fresh produce uh, they're not necessarily interested in the whole growing cycle and things like this yeah. and so this is where we come in and help and can say listen as you harvesting your plants we can supply you with new plants and things like this just plug in and play basically 
Uh, so there's a whole range of what's available uh, to people and yeah, um, unlike in certain places, even in South Africa or overseas and things like this, like you get hydroponic shops. Like I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a whole ecosystem so, basically. Yeah. Uh, but here it's not quite there yet. You need to go around and source different things and yeah. whatnot. So we are trying to work towards becoming a, a one-stop shop basically for yeah. these sort of systems and setups. Uh, but it is still a work in progress. Okay. Today, I discovered the flood and drain side of hydroponics. Dean continues to explain. The, the name is self-explanatory. Yeah. The, the water floods in and then it drains out. Yeah. So the important things here is that uh, it, it has to be regular. Uh -huh. So your, your, your seedlings need to get access to a certain amount of water all yeah. the time. Uh -huh. um, and also they need to be able to dry out actually. Yeah. Which might be counterintuitive, but if it doesn't dry out as well, there are other problems that can develop like root rot or damping off, which is a problem where the, the stem, because it's constantly exposed to moisture, yeah. begins to rot essentially. You, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> the important thing is the timing of it all. Um, so I mean, for example, we do make these flood and drain systems and we size them according to the production that we are doing. Uh -huh. um, and then you have to, you can size the container that you have your water in, your sump basically, which is your tank, your water yeah. reservoir, uh -huh. uh, accordingly to that. Okay. So we've worked out basically through trial and error just how long uh, do the plants need to be exposed to water in order to totally absorb uh, yeah, the, the, the new water and the moisture. Exactly, into the growing medium. And then how long does it take before they dry out again? So for example, we currently have this on a, a timer mm -hmm. which pumps in every two days, basically. Okay. So floods it and then dries out over two days and floods it again. Wait, um, so it floods it? For like a whole complete two days, the water. No. Oh, okay. No, it uh, the water pumps in for about 50 minutes or so, uh -huh. um, and in those 50 minutes, like it, it the, the the moisture is absorbed into the growing medium, and, yeah. and then it drains out, and then it actually remains wet for about two days uh, before you need to flood it again. Nice. Um, and this is especially the, the, the majesty of cocoa peat, yeah. uh, which is just, it's extremely water retentive. So it holds that moisture for a very long time um, and allows the plants to absorb it as and when they need. Yeah. So, we, so we start our germination here yeah. because of the density which you can get here. Okay. I mean, we can be fitting in uh, 200 plants per square meter here. Yeah. Uh, and because they don't need a lot of space, as you can see here, there, there's most of the space is taken up by the growing medium and then it's a tiny little space for the plant. But as they start to develop and mature, they need more space. Yeah. And this is where we then transplant them into our systems. Oh, okay. So it's mostly about space efficiency. What are your future aspirations for, future, for urban harvest? Hmm. Uh, they're vast and wide. <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, so it's, it's a bit of a multi-pronged approach, yeah. really, uh, because we do various things. Yeah. I mean, so we, we sell produce right. directly to restaurants at this point in time. Yeah. Um, almost exclusively lettuce and uh, restaurants just here in the immediate area mm -hmm. of Eros and Klein yeah. um, and. As we start to grow, we want to, first of all, expand the uh, product offering mm -hmm. uh, away from just lettuce to start looking at herbs and other green leafies and things like this yeah. and start working towards fruit and crops as well. Mm -hmm. And as we start to grow our expansion and expand our produce, we would like to start offering it to supermarkets. Um, as, yeah, but then we're also looking at, besides just produce sale, uh, sales, we also look into selling systems. So we actually develop systems yeah. uh, and we sell these uh, to people, especially people who are based in remote locations. Yes. Um, so like uh, lodges, the tourism industry is a big one, yeah. farmers on certain places, mines. Uh, you know, local constituencies and things like this, and yeah. conservancies, mm -hmm. people who don't always have access to fresh produce on a regular basis mm -hmm. uh, and who want to decentralize the production process basically. Yeah. So grow things on site as close as possible. Yeah. Um, so we, we assist with this 
um, and then as well as to offer trainings. Uh, yes. So okay, actually, I think that's the, the biggest thing: teach men how to fish. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I do think that incorporating technologies and growing are part of the solution to many of these problems mm -hmm. when it comes to feeding a growing population, to being more dependent, to reducing the food miles and the transport costs and the carbon emissions that come with it. Yeah. And also, I mean, this is a bit of a utopian sort of uh, situation, yeah. but to be able to almost make cities self-sustainable, grow yeah. all your food, produce all your energy uh, and all your water inside the city, mm -hmm and let everything around the city boundaries be reclaimed by nature. Yeah. Let it go back to wilderness, let it become natural again in its own ecosystem, and we become visitors to these wild places outside our cities. Because, yeah. um, I mean, this is one of the most effective ways to combat climate change, is to let nature do its thing. You can reach out to Urban Harvest to help you get started on your urban farming project. You will also be glad to know that all the hardware needed can be sourced locally at shops like Classic Aquatics right here in Winterg. Until then, keep farming.